So we're going to turn to Proverbs 31. So you can turn there, and I'm going to pray real quick. Uh, Father, we just thank you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you just bless this message, Father. Um, thank you for moms. Thank you for moms. I know my mother spent a lot of time on her knees and praying, Father, late, late nights as I was out wandering the world. And, Father, we just thank you for them, Father, for their tender hearts. We ask that you would just take this message, Father, and bless it to our hearts, Lord. And, Father, speak to the hearts of moms. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen. So, I was looking up different mothers in the Bible this morning. I have allergies, so everything is like a blur to me right now. Um, and, and as I was doing that, I found some very interesting moms in the Bible. Uh, some of whom we know about, and some of whom you don't know about. All right? But we're going to look at them today and just kind of kind of see what, what God did when he gave moms to us. So, in Proverbs 31... It talks about the Proverbs 31 woman, the woman of virtue, okay? And, 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 and this was written, believe it or not, by Bathsheba to King Lemuel. Now, as I began to look this up, I said, well, where is this going? Who's King Lemuel? Because nobody really knows. So as I began to investigate and find out who King Lemuel was, I found out that a number of people in their research have come to the decision that King Lemuel is actually Solomon. Okay? Now Solomon was the wisest man on earth. If we read Proverbs and we read a lot of the things that Solomon wrote, he, he tried different things, he looked at different things, he, 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 he blew different things, he did a lot of different things in his life that all of a sudden he came to the decision that it's all smoke, it's all wind, the only thing that matters is putting Christ first. That was what Solomon came to the decision of. Now we know that Solomon had very many wives and all this other stuff and nothing brought him contentment. Nothing brought him contentment but Jesus Christ. And so if you're looking for something that's going to bring you contentment, the only thing that's going to bring it is Jesus Christ. That's the message that Solomon was trying to get across. But in this, in Proverbs 31, verse 10, it says, A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth four, far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. I think of mothers that, you know, try to make great, great meals, and then the kids sit there and go, Ew, I'm not eating that. <laughs> I, my mom used to try to make sure that we always had the basic food groups on the table. There was always something green, something meaty, something this, something that. And a lot of the times it was peas. I hate peas. I can't stand peas. I love pea soup, but I hate peas. And so my mother used to look at me and go, you use the most napkins out of any kid in the world. Because I used to take and put the spoonful of peas in my mouth and then go, and tuck it under the table. And so I would go back later on and I would look under the table and there'd be napkin stuffed all along. Well, my mom finally got the the gist of that. And one day she goes, oh, by the way, don't forget your napkins full of peas under the table. You see, there's something interesting about moms. They always know what's going on. So don't think that you can ever hide anything from a mom, because they always know what's going on. So here's King Solomon, and here's Bathsheba saying this. So, she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. I remember rolling into my house at 2 or 3 in the morning and my mom's still up. And my mom's praying because she has no idea where I am. 
but she's not going to bed until the last son is in the house. And, and it's really kind of amazing to watch moms as they lay down their lives continuously, all the time. As we begin to look at a few ladies in the Bible that were moms, we're going to see that as we were called, they were called. They were called to be in the roles that they were. Okay? So let's just keep reading just a little bit more here. So it says, She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet, dressed for warmth, and they look like that little kid that's on the Christmas carol, that Christmas story that looks like he's a tick. A tick full of mud. All right? and you've all seen the movie where he waddles out of the house, he falls down, and he can't get up. And I can remember those days where my mom would bundle me up, and so I couldn't move. If I had to scratch something, I couldn't scratch it. I could barely walk down the road. But she made sure we were warm. She made sure we were taken care of. Bread bags in the boots. Bread bags in the boots. Wonder bread bags in the boots. Absolutely. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Do you hear that, kids? Faithful instruction is on your mom's tongues. Um, she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's the important thing. Say, moms have been given a special heart. Dads are teachers. We teach how to go out, kill animals, skin them, so we always have food and something to wear. It's what we do. We teach you how to change oil, we teach you how to change a tire, we teach you how to check your oil so your car doesn't blow up. Some people don't listen to that. That's what we teach you. But moms, moms teach you how to survive. Moms give you wisdom that help you achieve the place that God has called you to be. Because you know what? Moms, even though they don't get treated sometimes with respect, never leave their post. They never leave their post. And they're constantly praying for us. I think of all the moms that I had throughout history, and I had a ton of moms. I mean, you, you could not be anywhere without running into somebody that wanted to be your mom when I was growing up. We were involved in, in a pretty active church, and I was kind of the one that was always out doing something other than what I should be doing. And so I always had somebody that was trying to mother me back into the right place. And so no matter where I turned, there was always somebody. I had more mothers praying for me than I think any kid in the world. Just because they knew if we don't pray for him, he's definitely going to end up somewhere that he's not supposed to be. And so moms constantly pray. Moms constantly keep vigil over their children. So let's look at a couple of moms real quick. But I want to go to the last verse in verse 31. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gates. I have a funny feeling that when moms stand before God, he is going to have a special reward for them. Because they're up early, they're up late, they're praying, they're preparing, they're getting things ready so that the family can function. So, let's look at a couple ladies real quick. The first one we're going to look at is Eve. Now, Eve was the very first mom. Eve was formed for a purpose. And the name, name Eve means life. She was the first mom. Who did she get to ask when the baby needed changing? 
Who did she get to go to when the child was teething? Who did she get to go to when there was a certain sickness going on? Nobody. Eve was the pioneer mom. Eve didn't have anybody to turn to. The only person Eve could turn to was God. And sometimes Eve made the wrong decisions. Moms will make wrong decisions sometimes. Moms will make wrong decisions sometimes. But it's because they're trying to figure things out so that they can make life good. You need to understand that. So Eve was the very first mom. She didn't have anybody to help her do things with. So Eve meant life. Eve brought life into the family. One of the hardest things that Eve could have ever done was to be cast out of some place where she thought she would be forever. I remember my mom and my dad would come home and say, oh, I bought a hotel in Florida. We're, moved. we're going, we're going. I'm looking at property in this state. We're going. And my mom would say, oh, and we pack everything up, and off we go. She always made wherever we were home. So Eve had to pack up the garden and go out. See? One of the hardest things to do for a mom is to pack it all up, move it all out, and make something a home again. And so moms have a tough job. Let's keep going a little bit here. And then we want to go to Sarah. Sarah is the hope mother. It's kind of interesting when God told Sarah, I will give you a son. And then waited till she was 90 years old to give it to her. Sarah even tried to manipulate it by bringing in a concubine to her husband, Abraham, and saying, here, she's going to give you a, a child. And of course, we all know about Ishmael and Isaac. So one day, three travelers come in, and they're looking there, and they're talking to Abraham, and they say, Sarah will give you a child. And Sarah laughed. And Sarah laughed. God said, excuse me, Sarah. Uh-uh. And within a year's time, she was giving birth to a child. Ninety years old. Sarah always wanted a child. But see, she, she thought her womb was barren. And she was the hope mom. She was the one that hoped God would do what she wanted him to do. And he did. So there's never no hope. There's always hope. It may not be in your time frame. It may be in God's time frame. But hope exists. And Sarah is the symbol of for moms. I remember that Crystal and I tried to have kids the first, from the time we got married, she said, I want to have a child. And God just decided not to give us one. Instead, he gave us everybody else's kids, and they all showed up at our house in droves. And so we never had our own children, but we had everybody else's children, and they became our children. You see, Crystal still had hope. <clears throat> so hope is never lost. Hope is never lost. So then we want to go on, and we want to talk about Bathsheba a little bit. You know her. You know her. She was the one that had an affair with David. Then David had a plan to cover her. And in his covering, you know, men sometimes are really stupid. We try to find interesting ways to take care of things, and they usually are the wrong way a lot of times. And so here we have David trying to cover this up. Well, the amazing thing about Bathsheba is she gave birth to the wisest man in the world, Solomon. Solomon was her son, which brings me to this. There are many times that we think God can't take something bad and turn it good. The word repentance comes to mind. 
if we go to God and say, Lord, forgive me, I, I need to change what I've done, I, I pull the, an oops. Repentance brings in life. Now, you see, something bad between David and Bathsheba happened, but something amazing came from that. And that was Solomon. And so as Bathsheba was raising Solomon, you, you, you probably know, he was the wisest man. She became the mother, the symbol of redemption. Because God can redeem the time and make something good out of it. And you know that Bathsheba was like, oh, wow, you know, how can God do this? Ah, oh, it wasn't good. But she said, Father, forgive me. David repented. Bathsheba repented. And Solomon was born. And Solomon became the wisest man on the world. So we have hope and redemption. We have hope, Sarah. We have redemption, Bathsheba. All right? So I'll tie together when I'm done. And then, please turn to Exodus 2, verse 1. This is a, a little known woman, but if you look at her life, you will see where God had a plan, and he brought it to fruition as long as we trust in him. Verse 2, Exodus 2, verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. See, back then, Pharaoh wanted all the Jewish boys to be killed. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And then his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. I want to introduce you to Joshebed. Joshebed was Noah's or Moses' mom. Joshebed went against the rules of Pharaoh and had this baby and then hid him. Knowing that she couldn't keep him anymore, she built a little ark. <laughs> Not a big ark like, like, the, like Noah did, but she built a little ark. And she gave that baby up. She put him in the ark, floated him down the river. She knew she couldn't keep him. Because if she did, it would jeopardize his life. Okay? I want to read on a little bit here. Joshebed was the mom of let go and let God. Let go and let God. She had to let go of her son, trusting that God would provide exactly what he had said he would. So she had to let go. Now, many of you know my story. My mom was 14 years old when she had me, and she had to let me go. She tried to, to bring me up. In New London, Connecticut, as a 14-year-old, having, having a small child, living at home, back in the 60s. There it is. So she had to let me go. One of the hardest things that we have to do sometimes when our kids get older is let them go. We have to let them go. Um, I remember when we first let our oldest daughter go, I cried like a baby. It was like, oh, no. And God said, do you trust me? Those are his favorite words to me. Do you trust me? If you do, then let me do what I got to do. You've taught her, <clears throat> you've told her the things that you need to do. And now you need to let her go. My wife handled it better than I did. See, she said, well, we've taught her everything she knows. We now need to see if it's stuck. <laughs> Off she went. So here's Joseph, and she's actually giving away her child, saying, God, I trust you. So here's how God works in that. So when Pharaoh's daughter found him, 
she began looking for a nurse to feed him. A nurse to take care of him. And of course, who's watching? Moses' sister. So she runs up and goes, I know who. See, God has a plan. And so all of a sudden, she runs up to Josheben and she goes, this woman can help you. So not only now has she saved the life of her son by letting him go, but now she gets to take care of him until a point in time where he can go back to where God has called him, which was to lead the people of Israel out of captivity. Let go and let God. So we have hope. We have letting go, letting God. And we have Eve, who started all of this. Who learned how to go. Learned how to go. So go, have hope, and let God. So because of our trust in God in all things, the Israelites had their leader. And they were let out of captivity. All because Joshua who doesn't get talked about a lot in the Bible. Let go and let God. It's funny how we see all these things fitting into a pattern of moms. So let's look at Naomi for a minute. Please turn to the book of Ruth. And I'm not sure I want, where I want to go in here. Yes, I do. I want to go to chapter 1. And I want to go to verse 3. So now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Killian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husband and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to my sons, would you wait until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Here's the first picture of adoption in the Bible. The first picture of adoption. Why? Naomi was the mother of the sons that these two women had married. But Ruth decided to stay with Naomi, and Naomi took her in. Now Naomi, as she walked to where the places that God would call her back to Judah happened, Ruth stayed with her. Naomi taught Ruth many things. But Naomi also gave Ruth her blessing. Because as we see later on, Ruth married her kinsman redeemer, Boaz. Now in that, because Naomi took care of Ruth, Boaz took care of Naomi. So Naomi represents all the moms that have stepped up and taking care of children that did not have moms. 
Naomi is a representation of the unconditional love of a woman and sacrifice that comes from knowing who Jesus Christ is. It's amazing, and most of you know, my wife and I have done foster care for a number of years, and I know there are others in this church that have taken other kids into their homes. And there's this interesting thing. You take them in, you love them unconditionally, and usually you end up, at some point in time, finding some that can't do it. They're too broken to stay. I, I have one that I'm still in contact with. Her name is Ashley. I love Ashley to pieces. Ashley is one of those kids that just could not be fixed. So we had to let her go and let God. We don't know how long it's going to take for God to do what God does. But again, we had to let her go and trust God. So the moms that take in the kids that are not theirs, I know God has a special reward for you. Because you are giving your heart. And sometimes it's getting broken. More so than it ever could be. So Naomi, as we go on here, is the mother that represents sacrifice and unconditional love. Ruth knew Naomi was going to take care of her, much like we know that Christ will take care of us. He will redeem the time that's lost. Now here's something interesting. Because Ruth married Boaz, Ruth gave birth to Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. All because and Naomi took Ruth and did what she did. Then David was born. David became the king. If we look at the certain lineages of, of, of David and, and on down, we see that there's a number of places in there where the women had to trust God. And, and it's so funny because I see on Monday nights, I drove by here last Monday night, and there was more cars in the parking lot than I've ever seen. And it was a ladies' Bible study. And these are all moms that are here establishing themselves with Christ, finding out how to be the best that they can possibly be inside of the Word of God so that they can go home and minister to others. See, women never stop. Women never stop. Moms never stop. My mom never stops praying for me. She still prays for me today. Never stop. I've got this, this woman who's like a, a, a secondary mom to me. Her name is Nancy Mary. And Nancy Mary knew me. As a matter of fact, some of you have met Josh. Well, Josh's mom was my second mom. And then I have a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth and a tenth. I have like 30 moms. And Nancy never looked at me for what I was, but looked at me for the potential that she knew God was calling me to be. And so she would always, every opportunity she got, she would build me up, she would edify me, she would just say, you know, there's something in you that hasn't popped yet. And I'm thinking, oh God, I hope I don't have an aneurysm or something. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to pop, Nancy? <laughs> And so it's funny because we visited her the other day and Crystal was with me and the first thing she said is, I knew it was in you. I knew it was in you. Mother's heart. Constantly praying. Constantly asking God to protect. Constantly asking God to cover. Now we have the newest member of the, the deeper well back there in Linda's arms. It's her grandson. And, and it's really kind of neat because I know that Melissa being the mom that she is, is going to constantly be praying for that baby. 
And Evan is going to grow up and he's going to be running around here like a crazy kid, like most of the pain children are. I love them kids. They always smile and then they look at you deviously and go, watch this. <laughs> and mom still loves them even though they have a little deviousness in them. But I know that Melissa's going to constantly be on her knees praying, thinking, and saying, God, please protect my kids. Because that's what mothers do. She will have hope. She will have joy. She will have long suffering. There will be times of sadness. There will be happiness. There will be times where she will have to kiss boo-boos and make things better. Prayer will be constantly unending. Because it is for moms. Because that's the heart that God has given them. They will be praying constantly. So, where am I? And then... We have Mary. Mary was called to a special task by God. And that was to give birth to the Savior of the world. And Mary, well, you know, back then, for, for a young woman to be pregnant, it meant to be stoned. But she asked God, and she said, Okay, Lord, she said, I, I'm, I'm going to do what you have called me to do. No matter the cost. So Mary is the no matter the cost mom. No matter the cost, I am going to follow God's plan. No matter where it takes me, no matter what it does, no matter what the cost, I will say, Yes, Lord, here am I. There's a million moms that say, Yes, Lord. Here am I. Here am I. I know, I know my son, or I know my children right now, may not be in the right place, but I'm trusting you, Lord, and yes, Lord, here am I. I will never give up. I will pray constantly. I will be there constantly. I will do whatever it takes. I will do whatever it takes. Sometimes that's making decisions for your children that they're not going to like and having them get angry with you. No matter the cost. No matter the cost. <coughs> so as we go on here just a little bit. So you know Mary had it tough because here's the Son of God roaming the earth. And of course you know Jesus had his own mindset. He knew what he was called to do. And so I can imagine Mary when Jesus is out and he's roaming around and he goes to the temple and Mary can't find him. And she's scouring the town. And as she finds him, Jesus is sitting there and goes, well, I was doing the work of my father. That's no big deal. I remember one day my brother, and we were in, in New Hampshire, we were at uh, Hampton Beach, and my brother decided at four years old he was going to go cruise the town. And so he walked out the front door and took off. And we had the whole Hampton Beach Police Department and everybody looking for him. My mother probably would have ripped his face off if he would have said, I was doing the work of my father. <laughs> Can you imagine the worry? Can you imagine the worry of a mom when she doesn't quite know what's going on? And the only thing she can do is hit the knees and pray. Because that's all she can do. And so Mary was in a special place called by God. And then we see Mary watching her son be crucified. And she knew that she would have to let him go. You see, moms are the only ones that stay with us to the end. They're the only ones that stay with us to the end. Friends will scatter. People will come. People will go. But a mom stays put when the rest of the world walks away. Mothers are always there. So who was Mary? She was the truster in God's plan. 
She trusted God in all things and never doubted his plan, his provision, or denied him his pleasure of bringing his plan to fruition. So, as I was sitting there, and I'm going over this message, I just tapped my mic. <laughs> I've been getting texts from somebody most of this week, and we've just been talking about moms. And he was telling me about his mom. And so he sent me this little message and asked me if I would recognize a person. We're going to do, by the way, we're going to do communion. And, and moms, after service, we have some flowers for you afterwards. We want to make sure that the moms got blessed today. Because, um, again, moms are the bomb. You know, moms are the bomb. You know, I can remember, yeah, you know, I can remember my mom, uh, who's only yay tall. Well, she's a little taller than this. <laughs> but I remember my mom one day, I said no to her. She picked me up, put me on the counter, took a frying pan off the stove, and went, boom! Just about knocked me out. She said, I'm your mother. And I said, yes, I now know that. <laughs> <laughs> so as we were talking, he sent me this little letter. You might want to get your tissues out, because I know this is probably going to affect you. So. so, here it goes. I just wanted to send a short message from Crow Oregon. And he highlighted O-R-Y-G-U-N, like I don't know how to spell Oregon. By the way, this gentleman's name is Chris. And Chris is Suzanne and Curtis's son. And uh, pull it together, Mark. And it's really kind of neat because Chris and I have developed kind of a neat little relationship. Um, if I don't send my text messages to him on time, I, I get, uh, are you okay? Is everything good? Because <laughs> the message is late. And so him and I have kind of built this little relationship. So he says, I want to tell you about a special lady that is so special to me and that I have the utmost respect and love for. See, he would love to be here, but he's halfway across the country. On this Mother's Day, I would like to recognize Suzanne Lloyd, my mom and friend. My mom taught me to be the person I am today. She taught me to love the Lord at a very young age. She taught me respect for others as well as patience. My mom has never judged me, even when I did the stupidest thing. Does that not sound like a mother's heart? But she guided me to make the right decisions. My mom helped me raise two older daughters and took me back into her home in a very difficult time in my life. Her love for me has never been in question. There's a story I would like to share. It was 1980 and my mom was on a weird fad type of diet. And I actually like this diet, so I'm going to try it. She had prepared an amazing meal for all the kids and dads. Since mom was fasting, she sat at the table with only a Diet 7-Up. I'm going to try this diet when I get home. I'm going to drink as much Diet 7-Up as I can and not eat. I'll probably explode. <laughs> we all complained so much, but in the reality of our minds, she was lucky to have soda for dinner. I would think so. <laughs> so she finally offered up her drink to us. I could go on and on about this wonderful lady and how her dad, how her and dad provided a wonderful childhood for all his kids. I wish I could be there today to hug her on Mother's Day. But I will see you soon, Mom. Thank you for many wonderful times and being the best mother ever. Happy Mother's Day, Chris. You see, here's a funny thing. That's an awesome thing. You can talk about. Here's the most amazing thing about it. Because I've sat down, Crystal and I have sat down with Curtis and, and Suzanne, and we know that they were foster parents at one time, too, and it's tough. It's tough being foster parents. And one of those things is, sometimes moms have to be the ones that make the tough decisions. And they get the most flack. Because dads just go, and that's it, you're done. But moms take the heat. But God has also called moms to a special place in their hearts. He's called moms to be the ones that are the sacrificial, that lay down their lives, 
and do the things that Jesus did. To love unconditionally, to always be in the place that they need to be, even though their children may not like what they say. God was called to be a sacrifice. A lot of people didn't like, or Jesus was called to be a sacrifice. A lot of people didn't like what he did. He got flat. But what did he do? He kept thinking about them. He kept loving them. And he stayed vigilant to the end. Thank you, moms, for staying vigilant to the end. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I didn't really give a salvation message today, but I got to do this anyways. Because like moms, Jesus laid down his life. He made the tough decisions sometimes. But in the end, he became the sacrifice. Maybe you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. It's very easy. It's a simple prayer. It's, Lord, come into my life. Save me. Forgive me and guide me. It's that simple. There's nothing to it. It's just giving a prayer to him and believing in who he is. Forgive me, save me, teach me. I believe in you. Easy prayer. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you said that simple prayer today, then I would just ask, Lord, uh, I would just ask that you would raise your hand real quick and then put it back down. Is anybody saying that prayer today? Just lift your hand up and just put it back down. You only got to say it once. Thank you. One time. Father, you've seen the hands, Lord. You are the mother and the father. And Father, we thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for the moms that you have given us. For the moms that have been mothers to kids that didn't have moms, we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for their call. And so, Lord, in your precious name, Father, we lift this service up. Amen. If we could get the, um, uh, yeah, the communion ready real quick, then we can do that. Uh, I'm just going to share a couple little things real quick. Um, we got a couple. We met a couple friends, and I, I've got a couple things that are going to go on um, shortly. Um, I have a friend in Massachusetts.